This recently published study has been quite controversial to say the least. Antidepressants, particularly SSRIs, have been the mainstay treatment for depression. Since the first SSRI, fluoxetine, was introduced to market in January 1988 under the brand name Prozac in the United States. Since then, prescriptions for antidepressant medications have shot up. For example, over the past year, 8.3 million people in the UK, or about 12% of the population, were prescribed antidepressant medication. Meanwhile, over a two-month period in the United States, around 23% of all adults took some form of prescription medication for their mental health. The vast majority of these prescriptions were for SSRIs, which are often the first line of treatment for depression. A large part of the reason why SSRIs, or Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors, have been so popular with both the doctors prescribing them and the patients taking them, is because of the way depression and the drugs that help treat it were marketed to doctors and patients by pharmaceutical companies. In the early days, SSRIs were billed as magic bullets that were able to treat depression by restoring the brain's natural chemical balance. This idea that depression was the result of faulty brain chemistry dates back to 1965, when Harvard psychiatrist Dr. Joseph Schulkraut put forward the serotonin hypothesis of depression, which saw depression simplified and reduced into a condition caused by serotonin deficiency. Despite the lack of hard scientific evidence, Dr. Schulkraut's hypothesis caught on and became widely accepted. Today, surveys indicate that around 85-90% to of the public believes depression to be caused by low serotonin or a brain chemical imbalance. And in a survey of psychology students, 46% had heard depression described as a chemical imbalance by their physician. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac, Celexa, Lexapro, Zoloft, and Paxil are all believed to work and treat the symptoms of depression in more or less the same way. First, these drugs will block the reuptake of serotonin by nerve cells in the brain. This then increases the supply of serotonin that's available in synapses between nerve cells, which over time should help correct the brain's serotonin deficiency and restore the brain's chemical balance, easing the symptoms of depression. But as it turns out, this isn't how depression or SSRIs necessarily work. My name is Hashim and I'm a University of Cambridge graduate and medical doctor. Here on YouTube, I make videos about the human brain that explain how the brain works, why it sometimes doesn't, and all the different things that you can do to make it work better for you. There is no denying the enormous influence and hold that the serotonin hypothesis of depression has had on our understanding of depression, its treatments, and on mental health as a whole. Yet, this newly published systematic review by Professor Joanna Moncrief and her colleagues essentially debunks the claim that depression results from a serotonin deficiency in the brain. In their conclusion, the authors of the study write, The main areas of serotonin research provide no consistent evidence of there being an association between serotonin and depression, and no support for the hypothesis that depression is caused by lowered serotonin activity or concentrations. Some evidence was consistent with the possibility that long-term antidepressant use reduces serotonin concentration. This conclusion agrees well with skepticism of the serotonin model of depression something that has basically been an open secret in mental health circles for more than a decade. In fact, many academics like Dr. Michael Blumfeld were completely unsurprised and perhaps even underwhelmed by the study's findings. Reacting to the study, Dr. Blumfeld said in an interview, The findings from this umbrella review are really unsurprising. Depression has many different symptoms, and I don't think I've met any serious scientists or psychiatrists who think that all causes of depression are caused by a simple chemical imbalance in serotonin. Professor Phil Cowan at the University of Oxford similarly agrees with the study's conclusions. He remarked, I studied the role of serotonin in people with depression for three decades, and I'm broadly in agreement with the author's conclusions. No mental health professional would currently endorse the view that a complex heterogeneous condition 
like depression, stems from a deficiency in a single neurotransmitter. As part of the review, Professor Joanne Moncrief and her team identified 845 studies pertaining to serotonin and its role in depression. These studies were then assessed for quality and screened for eligibility to identify only the most relevant research. The key findings from the review can be summarized as follows. First, the primary research indicates that there is no support for the hypothesis that depression is caused by lowered serotonin activity or concentrations. In fact, the authors found some evidence that depressed individuals had higher serotonin activity than average. These findings were reiterated by several other studies that failed to establish a link between depression and low serotonin levels. Furthermore, the researchers also looked at studies where hundreds of people had their serotonin levels artificially lowered in an experimental setting. These people had their serotonin levels greatly diminished by depriving them of the essential amino acid needed by the body to make serotonin, tryptophan. The researchers found that lowering serotonin in this way did not in fact produce depression in any meaningful way in healthy volunteers. Moreover, as part of the review, the scientists also looked at studies that examined gene variations in the serotonin receptor. Their results showed that gene variations that gave rise to, to defective serotonin receptors, which bound serotonin less effectively, did not significantly increase the likelihood of developing depression. In other words, the people you would expect to be most at risk of depression, according to the serotonin model, were not any more likely to develop depression than healthy controls. A few things this review makes very clear is that patients should not be told by their doctors that their depression is caused by low serotonin or by some chemical imbalance. They should also not be led to believe that antidepressants like SSRIs work by correcting some hypothetical and unproven serotonin deficiency. After all, this kind of talk will inadvertently shape how individuals with depression see their depression and how they see themselves as individuals. It may also even paint antidepressants like SSRIs as being the only viable treatment or choice that can correct this unproven serotonin deficiency easing depression symptoms. So what should patients be told about depression and SSRIs instead? In the interests of patient autonomy, doctors should be completely transparent with their patients. That's why you should know that SSRIs are in fact effective, meaning that they actually do work. But far from being the magic bullets that they were advertised by the pharmaceutical companies to be, SSRIs are only modestly better than placebo. In fact, a number of studies show that you can reproduce 80% of the response SSRIs produce by placebo alone, and 57% of trials funded by pharmaceutical companies fail to illustrate a statistically significant difference between treatment with antidepressants and treatment with placebo. The fact of the matter is we don't really know how SSRIs work primarily because we still don't quite understand how depression works. The most accurate model we have so far suggests that depression is the result of chronic stress and the effect that this chronic stress has on the brain. These effects are wide ranging and contrary to popular belief, extend beyond a simple serotonin deficiency. For example, we know that stressful life events can rewire the brain and that individuals who experienced adverse events during their childhood are at an elevated risk of this rewiring due to the epigenetic activation of vulnerability genes. During periods of chronic stress, new connections will be created between the parts of the brain that are involved in the stress response, like the amygdala, and brain regions involved in perception. Meanwhile, connections between brain areas that help us to reason and regulate our mood, attention, and behavior will either be weakened or altered altogether. This may explain why depressed people are often more pessimistic about the future and why depression often goes hand in hand with anxiety for many people. Crucially, however, there is plenty of scientific evidence that suggests SSRIs may help to prevent this brain rewiring, making the brain more resilient to stress though we do not know how they do this. Over time, brain rewiring can translate into anatomical changes. Depressed patients have been observed to have a smaller hippocampus and prefrontal cortex than average, for example. 
Treatment with antidepressants has once again been shown to reverse these neuroanatomical changes in the brain by several studies. Moreover, far from being just a serotonin deficiency, depression is now understood to be a complex condition that's affected by various different neurotransmitters, including norepinephrine, dopamine, glutamate, and glycine. The bottom line is that there is a lot that we do know, but there is still so much for us to uncover. Until then, pharmaceutical companies, the media, scientists, and physicians must treat patients with the transparency that they deserve. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified when I publish my next video. Until then, remember to keep calm and... Relax.